Hi, welcome to another episode of 256 Seconds with Donnet Dave. I'm David McCarter. If you remember in the last uh, episode, I talked about the first article in a series I'm writing on C-Sharp Corner called Improve Your Model Classes with Object-Oriented Programming Part 1, uh, The Basics. And in that article, I focused on talking about encapsulation, which is the first pillar of object-oriented programming. In this article, I'm going to continue that discussion and we're going to add some interfaces and some methods that we need to make our types even better. The first thing we need to talk about are constructors. In all types that I create, the only time I create a constructor with parameters is when that data in those parameters is required for that type. So let me show you how easy it is to add these constructors that we need for this person type. So all we need to do is go to the person class, click on the light bulb, and say generate constructor. And it'll bring up this dialog here. Now I don't want all the fields uh, for the constructor because I want to make email address and ID required. I want to choose those. And as you can see, I'm selecting the property and the ID. I'm not going to add null checks because the data is being validated in the property itself. And that's why I chose the properties and not the fields up here. So when I click OK, it generates this constructor here, which is perfect for us. But the next thing we need to talk about is serialization and deserialization of types which will probably happen with model classes at some point. So now that we've added a constructor with parameters, that basically wipes out the magic constructor that the C-sharp compiler will add if you don't add a constructor. The reason I bring up the magic constructor is because it's required for deserialization of types. So I'm just going to add it really quick here. And I'm all done. So this will work for serialization now. But for developers using this type, I really don't want them using this empty constructor here. So there is a attribute that I can add called editor browsable. And as you can see here, I'm setting its state to never. So this will basically hide this constructor from developers using this type from other assemblies. Not within this assembly, but other assemblies. And that's uh, basically what I need because this model class assembly is going to be used by many projects. It won't prevent them from using this constructor, but it will at least hide it from IntelliSense. The next thing I want to do is add a few interfaces. So I'm going to go up to the screwdriver up here, and I'm going to go down here to generate equals and get hash code. And that'll bring up this dialog again. Again, I don't want everything up there. For this example, I'm just going to be using, again, uh, email address and ID. And I leave selected, uh, implement the this interface, and also generate operators. This isn't super required, but in this example, uh, it is because I want to make sure that if someone does a not equals or equals to, it'll just use the email address and ID and not all the properties, which will be done by reflection. I select OK. It adds the interface up here. If we go down to the bottom, you can see it adds the equals here, which is checking for email and ID. It um, overrides the equals here and then just calls this equals down here. It also implements the get hash code. And again, it's only using the email address and the ID for this purpose. It also uh, implemented the equals and not equals uh, operators, but we're not done yet. Go back to the class, click on the screwdriver, and go to implement I comparable. And what that does is that the I comparable interface, which is older from .NET and the newer one that uh, takes a generic uh, person. So if we go down to what it wrote for us, it wrote uh, a couple methods down here. It wrote this compare to, which basically just calls down to this compare to, which then goes through and compares each one of the fields uh, of both types. You can go in here, of course, and edit. And if you only want to check uh, for email address and ID, uh, you can do that. 
For this purpose, I'm just going to leave it the way it is. So those are the constructors and interfaces uh, that I wanted to talk about for this article. Why are some of these interfaces important? Well, for sorting. If you look at some benchmarking that I've done for my code and app performance book uh, available on Amazon, you see here, in the mean here, this is the speed, the mean speed represented by the bar is the is the benchmarking I did at different collection counts of person type similar to the one uh, from the first article. Represented in the line here is the performance metrics uh, from a person type similar to the one from this article. And as you can see, in every case in .NET Core 3 and in the CLR 4.8, overloading uh, these methods actually really helps out the performance of your types when they're sorting. You might say, well, I don't care about sorting because the database will do that. Well, we're talking about model classes. We really don't know where the data came from, so you can't rely on that. Just be nice to the developers that will be using this type and just implement these interfaces. And you can see they're very easy to implement just by a couple clicks of the mouse. The next thing I want to talk about is something that really cool that developers using your type will really thank you for. I'm going to show you why. So if I create a, uh, a few people and stick them into a collection, and then I want to look at that collection during debugging, this is the experience you get. All it does is show right here, you know, the, the name of the type itself, which isn't very helpful. And uh, if I want to look at like the IDs of the types or the email address, I have to go into each one and look at each one and it's really time consuming. And, uh, you know, so how can we make this easier for developers? So we go back to our person class. On top of the person class, I'm going to add the debugger display. And in here, I'm telling it, okay, now when someone's debugging this type, I want you to show the email address instead of the type name. You can use any of the properties that you want. And in this case, I'm just using the email address. So now when I run it, now you can see, I can see the email addresses here, which makes it much easier to see uh, what data is actually in this collection of uh, people. So developers using your type will really, really like you adding this attribute. So make sure you do that. One last thing before I close this episode and the end of this article is I want to talk really quick about documentation. I briefly mentioned it in the last uh, video. Documentation is very important for your types, not only to document what your type does and why it does it uh, for people looking at your code later, but it's also used in the Telesense too, which is very important. So I document all my types, especially any reusable type I document for sure. Actually, I document everything, but uh, I pay closer attention to reusable assemblies. Uh, but I would say most developers are like myself. I don't like writing documentation. Uh, I'm not a writer. I'm a, I'm a developer. So I like tools that make it really easy on me. So a tool I've been using for a really long time is called Ghost Doc um, from submain.com. And I'm going to show you the way I use it. So in an example here where I've added equals and get hash code and the operators and such, I can simply just go up to this icon way up here. And what I typically do is document file. And document file does a couple of things I'm going to show you. So boom, there. It wrote all the document, all the documentation from here. It wrote. I didn't write a single word of this documentation. Totally worth uh, every penny, which this is a free add-in, so why you're not using it in Visual Studio is beyond me. Uh, and I also use this tool to generate the documentation for the properties too. I did edit the documentation just a bit for the properties to make it a little bit more understandable, but I probably spent maybe two minutes, three minutes uh, doing that, so very, very little time. The other thing I want to show you is at the very top here when you do document file with ghost doc, it also uh, adds the style cop compliant header to your type, which all your types should have. And I'm even talking to you, Microsoft, uh, with this um, important data in it. But the one thing I want to point out really quick is this last modified on. 
I don't know about you, but if that's there, it's almost a 99.99% chance I'm going to forget to update that when I make a modification to the class. The cool thing with Ghost Doc is that every time you do document file, it'll update that date for you. Uh, so when I'm before I check in a type, I always run Ghost Doc to make sure that's updated. So there you have it for the second article and for this episode of 256 Seconds with Donna Dave. I hope you'll check both of them out. I hope this helps you create better model classes for your projects. I'll see you on the next episode of 256 Seconds with Donna Dave.